Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your very kind introduction. Thank you for your friendship and your support. And more importantly, thanks for being my brother. I don't think I've ever had to worry where your leader was going to be in regard to my decisions or um, my desire to, to say that we need to shake up the labor movement a little bit. But I really want to start off, first of all, to thank all of you in this great union. I know the incredible work you do day in and day out as educational workers across this country and, and sorry, across this province. And more importantly, the work you do every single day to ensure that working people have a voice uh, in this country. I know many of the fights you've taken on, most people will say, well, they can't win, why are they fighting? What I want to say to you, when you told McGinty when he decided he was going to rip up your collective agreement and go to hell and you're going to fight, was the right decision. <laughs> was the right decision. Because uh, the day when we allow government to tell us we can do better, we can have to only can accept what they tell us they're going to give us, that's the day we lose and we don't need the labor movement. We may not win every fight we take on. By God, we have to fight. Because if we don't fight, we never get hope to make a better world and a better country for the future of working people in this country. So I want to commend all of you for the work you do. I know you're going to go into bargaining very shortly. I want to say to you, and as I will say to the Premier very quietly and very politely and very clearly, if you chose to pick a fight with my friends in the OSSTF, the full Canadian Labor Congress and his president will be beside you, side by side, step by step, to ensure you win your fight. I hope the Premier had learned that the way they've done things in the past is wrong, and maybe we can restore some of the relationship and goodwill. But they have to walk across the aisle and extend their hand for us to make that happen. So you will be, I will be there with you. Sisters and brothers, I know many of you came to the CLC convention and worked your heart out to help me get elected. I was very clear about what I said, that working people has got to start fighting back in this country. Fundamentally, the right has been on the march, and this is our time, and we are going to push back as hard as we can across this country, because if we don't, we will not have a future for our kids, and we will not have a future for our movement. I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart, sincerely, for the efforts and the work you put in to help me get elected as president. I do not intend to fail, and I will not fail with your support. Thank you so much. The CLC Convention is one of the largest in the history in our Congress, and rightfully so, because workers recognize whether they were supporting me or they were supporting Brother Giorgetti, what was at stake. 4,700 delegates came to that convention, the largest in the entire history in 57 years, because they understood this was a fight about the hearts of this organization that represents the aspiration of working people. I know what the consequence of losing, but you know I was so proud, regardless of what the consequence was going to be, because I knew I was fighting for my ideas, and fundamentally this movement needs to recognize that time you've got to shake it up. You've got to give, you know, you've been part of it. You've got to push back a little bit, and you've got to say, we can do better. We must try to do better. I think that convention sent a clear message. Workers are prepared to fight in this country. One thing was very clear at the end of that convention, and I've been across this country just this week alone from one end to the other, talking to workers as I'm expected to do. I've yet to meet a single worker that had been at that convention or from a union who didn't support me and said, Hassan, we're not with you. Everywhere I've gone across this land talking to working people, they said, we're with you. We cannot lose. This is our moment and we must fight and you need to inspire us and need to get us re ready because we need to defeat the most right-wing government we have seen in this country and by God, Stephen Harper better understand we will not fail in our decision to defeat his government in the upcoming election. I made it clear at that convention, the labor, of course, the labor movement we have to be on the offensive. We have to confront the austerity agenda. Why? We didn't create the crisis of 2008. Let's see the ravages around the world and in our own country of all the people who have lost their jobs because the bankers were let free to do what they want with the economy around the world. And you know what is interesting? That one of these, I wouldn't use words because I know you're taping this, has ever gone to jail. 
Yet 50 million workers with a snap of a finger lost their jobs. The global economy was pushed into recession around the world. And now we're told that we must pay the price for this. Right across this country, both in public and private sector unions, employers are insisting we've got to take less. We've got to give things up. We can no longer afford to do these things. But by the way, this does not apply to them. Well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for every worker in this country. We are not going to accept less. We'll demand we share the pie, and working people have a right to expect better, not less, in 2014. And I've made it very clear, sisters and brothers, I may come from the private sector, but make no misunderstanding about my commitment to public sector workers across this country. There will be no division. Wherever we are fighting to defend working people, I will be on their picket line, defending them, marching with them, and using my voice to ensure working people understand what the fight is about. As I went out to BC, to your brothers and sisters in the BCTF, who the BC government is trying to defeat, they will not defeat the BCTF union because those workers and that union is fighting for some of the basic things we take for granted. Why can't we insist that class sizes need to be smaller? Why can't we insist that kids who need special needs in the classroom have that service provide? This is a question of leadership and moral authority to say that yes, working people who send their kids to public school deserve better, and we should fund the bloody thing in the first place. If we can find money for tax cut, by God, we can find money to fund public schools. I've been there twice, and I'll be there as many more times as you request. When I said to Jim, you tell me, brother, when you need me to be on the phone, I'll raise as many millions of dollars as you need because the BC government will not defeat you. That's what the leader of the Congress should be. That's where he should be when he's requested to be. I don't need to sit in my office in Ottawa and pretend I'm the president of 3.5 million workers. I'm the president of Congress when I'm on their picket lines, when I'm standing side by side when they're fighting the struggles to defend their union, because that's where the president of CLC should be with workers across this land. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, We've been watching the wealthy and governments across this country we're waging war against working people. And I think fundamentally we've got to mobilize ourselves like we have never been. I also want to start to congratulate you. I don't think we've yet to understand and appreciate what we did in the most recent provincial election. We have had a right-wing ideologue in this province terrorizing working people for almost two years plus. He said if he was to become premier, he will get, bring in right, and Terry will be the first right to work province in this country. And then of course, when he realized that maybe he might lose, he changed his tune and said he was gonna fire 100 public sector workers, teachers and nurses, and public ser servants who provide service in this province every day. What he didn't understand is the collective effort of our movement. When we're pushed, and that's one of the hallmark of our movement in this country, when we're pushed, we will do what is right. The efforts that was put on by our labor movement in this province need to be saluted. Because I know for a fact more union members went to vote in this provincial election. More union members were talking in their workplace about what the Tim Hudak threat meant to their union because of the work we were doing collectively across this province. There were more effort devoted to ensure we were not going to lose and we could not lose. Imagine the conversation we will be having today if Tim Hudak was the premier of this province. Just think for a minute. In your mind, the conversation will be how we'll be waging war for the next four years against such a right-wing ideologue. And I think not only did we, did our message resonate with our members, but it resonate with people in this province right across this province. They recognize fundamentally what his agenda was all about was simply was ensuring that working people never make any gains. Those 100,000 workers he was talking about is our friends, is our neighbors, is our colleagues. Uh, when we did the research and said, here's what it will mean for these small communities, people understood it very clearly. At a time when we already have a job crisis, he was going to create a bigger one. Why? because he felt he was going to get away with it, because the public would hate public sector workers. Firing 100,000, 
by the way, Stephen Harper has done a good part of this. He seems to be getting away with it. Why would he not get away with it? I want to commend your union for the efforts and the resource you spent. Not one single penny that you committed and spent in the Ontario election was wasted. It sent a very clear message. When assholes like this threaten us, we'll kick your ass and we'll teach you a lesson. It was a fundamental victory for working people because every one of them in other parts of this country are paying attention. It was the labor movement and its efforts with our members across this province that made a difference. At a time when people thought people were cynical about politics, voter turnout went up 4% in the Ontario election. In the middle of summer, people couldn't decide what this election was about. I think it shows our sophistication and the good work we're doing. But you know, sisters and brothers, I'd be remiss. I'm from Toronto. I travel the world quite often on your behalf to speak to working people across the world. And now when I go across the world, people say, well, Hassan, where you're from? I said, I'm from Ottawa. Now, you may want to know why I say I'm from Ottawa. <laughs> and every Canadian who is from Canada actually now says we're, part of the, we're Americans. <laughs> because we have never had a bigger buffoon jackass, <laughs> lunatic, and I can go on at length. <laughs> you know, I, I said when David Miller, we had a party for him when he left, and I said, you know, the wonderful thing about people that you work with over time, and I worked with David Miller for the eight years he was um, mayor of the city, that there was never a time when you could stick a, a, a microphone in front of David Miller and ask him a question he couldn't articulate the values of the issues that he was confronted with. Now here we have a mirror, he can't even string two sentences together. <laughs> Yet the fact is he's such a national embarrassment to this city and to this country. And I know for those of you who live in this great city of ours, if we do one thing, come this October, we have to ensure we elect Olivia Chow as the next mayor of the city. <laughs> she represents our values. She will stand up and defend working people, and more importantly, will be proud. Because I know for the national embarrassment that we're all so shameful of, I can't wait to, to do whatever I can. I think I'm working with Brother John Cartwright, and we may have the largest shop stored assembly in this room here sometime at the end of September, because we're going to do everything we need to do to mobilize our members to assist Sister Olivia Chow in getting elected. So, sisters and brothers, there are also municipal elections going right across this province. This is the biggest year for us in the Congress. As you know, we spend a lot of resources on municipal politics for reasons. Those who sit on school boards should represent the interests of working people and their kids in the school boards. Those who sit at City Hall should represent our value. You see, we take too often the things that City Hall does. Right here on the stage, there's a canister with water. The water that comes out of the tap is owned by the people of this city. The best quality water is better than the, some of the bottled waters you would buy. If we don't elect people at City Hall who are going to defend the water system, who are going to ensure to remain there for working people, one day we'll wake up and it gets privatized as we've seen happening in other cities across this land. I live in this city. I can say I live beside one of the largest parks. It's absolutely a delight to go in that park in High Park. More working families come there because our tax dollars goes to maintain that park. We live in a city where the roads are clean. We have library. These guys would like to cut it. But the fact is that kids can send their, families can send their kids. My kids go to the public library all the time to borrow books, to borrow videos. The list goes on because those things exist. And that's the role of municipal government to help sure that we have a decent quality of life. It's the closest government to our lives in everything that we do. But yet we can't seem to motivate our members to go out and vote. I think we have to try harder. And similarly for the school board elections. Why do we elect people at school board? Because we want them to go there and defend public education. This is a right of working people. We don't have the luxury of sending our kids to private school. And if they're going to go to public school, we want to ensure those who are on the school board represent our values. They're not the millionaires in our province, in our country, in our cities. We want them to stand there and defend public education and to defend educational workers and teachers in that process. That's the people we want on our school boards. So sisters and brothers, whatever you can do in your work across this province over the next number of months that's left, 
please do your part. We have now elected over 1,600 school board trustees, mayors, and city councilors across this land. And I know we're not done yet. We're going to continue this work because we really want to take back the institution that belong to working people across this land. And the only way we can do that, we've got to get political and we've got to get involved. And I'm determined as your president to continue that work at the end of the day. So let me talk to you about some of the challenges, of course, with the Harper government. I don't need to tell you in 2015, we're likely to have an election. It was probably the most important election in our lifetime. You see, for many of us, many of the things that we have come to take for granted in this country, many of us, not all of us, but many of us, didn't have to fight to create. I had nothing to do with the national health care system that we so enjoyed across this country. I had little to do with creating the unemployment insurance system they are supposed to look after workers when they lose their job. I had nothing to do with creating the national pension system that provides resources in people's pocket when they get old and they retire from work. But all these things as I speak to you today are under threat because of the most, most mean-spirited government we've ever seen in the history. In a very systematic way, this government, in a creeping little by little, are rechanging this, reordering this country, are dismantling the things that's been the hallmark of what made this country a great nation. You see, we could have been just like our American neighbors, but it was a question of choice that we made, and working people fought for and created the thing that gave this country value. And as we watch this government, as they're about to enter the last year in their mandate, they're going to try to dismantle as many as they can. But I want to revisit for you. This is a government that brought in a piece of legislation called Bill 377, Transparency in Union Finances, with never having to explain what is the transparency about. You see, you probably, I go to teachers' conventions, public sector union convention, private sector unions convention. There are more debate in our unions about finances. I think sometimes we're too anal about finances, but just happened to be the secretary treasurer from the Congress. The bigger fight is about the political work. But it is important that workers understand that it's their finance, it's their union, they have a right to question. We did a piece of research to give you some example regarding Bill 377. To find out how many places across this country in labor board where there have actually been complaints from members about their union finances, we found six. There are four million union members in this country. There's over 25,000 local unions in this country, and there have been six complaints. In the federal jurisdiction, which the federal government have the authority to regulate in, the CIRB governs that jurisdiction. There have never been a single complaint sustained against any union in the federal jurisdiction for not providing financial information to their members. But yet, 377 was passed. If it should ever become law, your local unions will be forever filling out paperwork after paperwork after paperwork to meet the federal government. They will have to, of course, hire thousands more people to work in the department to make sure we comply with the law. This has got nothing to do with transparency. This is not about transparency. Let's be clear what this is about. This is about how unions spend their money to defend their collective agreement and, of course, to get involved in the political arena. Imagine if you, you, your union OSSTF was restricted from doing political work when the government attacked your rights as they did the last time. Where would your members be? It will just give license to the next government to continue doing it because you couldn't fight back. What the Harper government is really trying to do with Bill 377 is to level, limit our political involvement to defend our collective agreement and our social gains in this country. I want to say unequivocally and clearly, no government will ever legislate the labor movement from such actions. Our history and our destiny is to defend the interests of our members and the broader interests we represent the working people. And they can pass any legislation they want. We will defy it if necessary, but fundamentally, we will never conform to those actions. <laughs> Mr. Harper may think he can import American-style legislation to try and attack the labor movement, but he, he misunderstands us and our determination. Same government that brought in private members' bill, C-525. We have had card check in the federal system for over 70 years. Just like that, private members' bill comes along, got rid of card check. When they went before the parliamentary committee to hold hearings, even the employer, FEDCO, 
major employer organization said, we didn't ask for this. We're not asking for this. We like the current system. It's a balanced system. But yet, the legislation passed. Now sitting in the Senate, we'll see what they do with that. C4, your colleagues, our colleagues in the public sector, PSAC, they passed the bill to change the essential service agreement the union have had for decades, where they can designate 80% of the members of that union essential service. Can you imagine trying to maintain a strike if 80% of your members can't participate in the strike? How effective is that going to be? Never one ounce of justification while they're doing it. When Tony Clement was confronted and asked on CBC, why is he doing this? How would he define essential service? His response is, I'll define it when I define it. Such arrogance and contempt. Yet, in all the decades have passed and all the times that PSAC have had an essential service agreement with the federal government, not once did they ever broke it or violate it, but yet they passed the law. This is the same government that brought in legislation to change the definition of the right to refuse. The most fundamental thing for workers is when they believe their health and safety or their lives is a threat in the workplace, they can refuse unsafe work. Yet they brought in legislation to change the right to refuse. Not a single debate. I went before the committee and said, we actually have a tripartite system in the federal government. It's never once it's been raised. There's something wrong with that, 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 that legislation. Had nothing to do. They didn't provide an explanation. They just changed it unilaterally. And the list goes on and on. This is the same government, by the way, of legislated workers since 2011, six times back to work. Canada Post workers, the Crown Corporation, they locked them out. They legislated them back to work without any hesitation. Air Canada workers, they spent one decade giving concessions time after time to save that company, to make sure it didn't go bankrupt. The first chance they get an opportunity to bargain to make some gains, to recover some of the things they had given up in concessions with the employer, the government intervened five times and legislated different unions back in Air Canada. As a matter of fact, as a result of that legislation, future employees except for one union no longer have a defined pension plan. Every future employee in Air Canada will never have a defined pension plan because of what this government allowed to happen. The only union to survive that was the CAW now uniform because they had taken a different strategy. But fundamentally, it again, had nothing to do with recognizing the sacrifice those workers made to help this company survive. And the minute they get a chance to bargain, this government intervened. CP Rail Worker, the company was threatening to take away the pension plan of those workers. Again, the government legislation. Most recently, we're told no longer we can afford to have door-to-door -door delivery of mail because the Harper government decided unilaterally this ain't going to happen. We'll all have to walk to some big mailbox somewhere down the street. But that's not what it's about. This is about destroying the fundamental tenets of what this country has been built on. Fairness, social justice, equality for all of us. And they're changing it in a very systematic way. Pay equity legislation, they passed a law forbidding public sector unions from helping their members when they have a pay equity complaint. As a matter of fact, they put a heavy fine on the union for simply assisting their members. All this happened. I can go on on the attack. Paul Martin did one thing I thought was remarkable. For all the things that we can remember that what he did was horrible. He brought in the colonial accord. An accord that was going to make some of the past wrongs in our country with First Nation people put it back on track. We we're going to finally devote resources to assist First Nation people to have an equal footing like the rest of us in society. Four billion dollars of money that was committed to that accord Harper won, of course, his majority, and more importantly, the Kelowna Accord was gone. gone. And here we are, they continue to stigmatize and raise the same kind of things we've seen done with the colonial governments today. The First Nation people can't be trusted, they're corrupt. The fact of the matter, they were the first people on this land. We came here as immigrants, all of us. After a hundred and something years, have we not learned anything? that we need, need to make past wrongs right? How are we going to do that if we don't put resources to assist First Nation people in having the same quality of education? As I speak to you and I can drink portable water that's healthy out of the glass here, for over 200 communities across this country, First Nation people can't have clean, portable water. Yet we live in a first world country. There's something fundamentally wrong, but try to tell that to this government it's like you're talking to 
a group of people who doesn't hear anything you have to say. My friends, I can go on at length, but what these guys are doing fundamentally, what they have done, they continue to reshape this country. I think if we don't take collective action across this country in the next election, this country will be forever changed. And we can't allow that to happen. You see, like many of you, this is our obligation, this is our moment, and this is our time. Because it's not about us. Some of us are a little bit older, we may be fine, we'll get to retirement, and we'll probably have a really decent life. But think of what we leave for the next generation. You see, for many of us, they even were able to live in a great country because the generation before us fought to make this country a better place. It wasn't like the rich and the powerful and the politicians woke up and says, we're gonna build this kind of Canada. It was a struggle. It's written in history, if you read the books, it was rich about the struggle that was been waged across this land to make this a better place. And we can't allow this government because they will forever change this country. And I can tell you one thing for sure. I'll be spending all my time from now until the next year, trying to get our members ready, motivated, engaged, and strategizing about how we kick these guys out of office in 2015. And we cannot fail. And it's critical for us to recognize this. You know, many people didn't think we could defeat Hudak. When you, look, took, when, you, when you look back on election night, I can tell you it was one of the sweetest moments to watch his pathetic face on television <laughs> announcing he was going to resign. And all, for those, all those other pathetic members of his caucus who we kicked their ass and lost having to come on television says it was the labor movement. Yes, it was the labor movement, and we're bloody proud of it. So let me get to the tough and the hard work. You know, some people say, when we elected you as president, we expect great things. I said, nothing wrong with expecting great things. As a matter of fact, I hope you kick my butt if I don't do great things. But more importantly, this is not a, just something about me. This is about us. We're going to do this collectively. Because if we're going to build a great labor movement, if we're going to fight the struggles to win the hearts and minds of our members, we have to do it together. And the fairness cam campaign we've been running now in the Congress is very critical. So I want to start with very, very basic. You see, like many of you, you may have came into the union that already existed in your workplace. You had nothing to do with organizing it, it was there. Some of you may have had to organize, but the majority you didn't. Collective agreement existed. Pensions plans were already established. The wage grid for the good wages you get was already there. A lot of our members, if you look at the majority of our members in our movement, joined our movement over the past 10, 20 years having nothing to, to, to do with the struggles of the union in the past to help build the union. And we've got to revisit the relationship and the conversation with our members and a one-on-one -on -one conversation about the value of their union, the importance of the work their union does. And I know some of this is difficult. You know, I get to talk to all kinds of people. Some of it is easy, some of it is harder. People who doesn't want to hear what you have to say. Members who are frustrated because they felt the union haven't served them very well. You see, we don't get to duck this. We have to struggle with it day in and day out to engage our members. And I'm no different like any one of you. When I joined the union, I was fortunate. I was making $4 an hour working in a workplace. And one day I decided, I don't know why, to ask my supervisor for a raise. He said, yes, the sand, you can get a raise. Two weeks later, he came back, 35 cents an hour. I was incensed. I was just so crazy. I started swearing at him and everything else. And he looked at me, thought I was mad. And he said, what's, what's your problem? Well, I said, I thought I was going to get a dollar raise. He said, no, oh, you're only getting 35 cents. You know, that's what the manager says. Of course, there was no union there. I bought a newspaper. That same, the next day, came in, flipping through the want ad. I saw exactly the same job I was doing that paid $7.35 an hour. They had the entire ad laid out everything that, that they had in that workplace. They had a dental plan. They paid your OHIP premiums, how much vacation you would get. You know, and the list goes on and on and on. And then something small on the bottom it said, you had to join the union if you work in that workplace. I went immediately at lunch hour, went to the washroom, got changed. Supervisor said, where are you going? I said, I'll be back, maybe. <laughs> True story, just took off, didn't care when you're young and 18 sometimes, I don't know. You do crazy things. I went there, made an application. The manager says to me, when can you start? I said, actually, right now. He said, no, no, don't you have to give your employer's notice? I said, bloody well, no, I don't have to give him any notice. 
I started working there. Better wages, working conditions. Finally, somebody came to me one day and said, Hassan, we're having a union meeting. I looked at him kind of weird. I said, what? I said, a union meeting. I said, oh, okay. He said, Sunday at 1 o'clock. I looked at him. I said, no, I don't. Sunday, I don't think so. <laughs> Didn't say a word. No, don't forget, three months probation. I've been there three months. I'm making good money. I'm just a little bit over 18 now. Life is good. What do I do on my weekends? I get paid on Thursday. Friday night, I get drunk. <laughs> Saturday night, I get drunk. And Sunday, I try to recover because I realize you got to show up to work half decent, ready for Monday morning. He came to me again another month. He said, Hassan, we're having a union meeting. I scratched my head and said, did you not? He said, yes, we had one last month. One o'clock, running me in Sinclair. I said, um, no, I'm not going to be there. So he finally looked at me. He said, I said, no, well, my habits haven't changed. He didn't know what my habits. I said, well, you know, I kind of party all weekend, you know. Sorry. Third month, he come to me again. I said, you in the meeting, right? He said, yep. I said, I know. One o'clock, running me in Sinclair. He said, you remember? I said, yeah, I've been remembering from the first time you told me. I just haven't got there yet. <laughs> I went to that meeting the third time. Sat in the last row. There was no lights. Nobody could see me. And I listened to the conversation. Mostly men talked about the issues in the workplace, about health and safety, violation of the collective agreement, supervisor picking on certain members, mostly older workforce. And I thought to myself, this is fascinating. I was just blown away. Never missed a union meeting, and I'm here today to tell you as a result of that effort. But there's two other points I need to make about that conversation. The brother who actually came to me and encouraged me to go to the union meeting. His name was Bill Merlin, he was the plan chair. One thing he did, I still remember today, because I saw him many years later, he never judged me about my behavior. He didn't make any comments. He was consistent and persistent that I had to come to a union meeting. And because of that persistence and consistency, I did go. I learned something from that. More importantly, he left that workplace after some time, not very long after, and he said, the Santa was leaving, and he came to me one day, and he said, I'm leaving, and I want to talk to you a bit. And I said, oh, I'm very sad, because I really liked him. He was a very great union leader. Pragmatic, approachable, engaging, you know, always found a way to build a union. And he said, I think you should run for my job. By now, I was 18 years and a half. And I looked at him, I thought, I said, are you mad? <laughs> and he said, no, no, I'm not mad. I'm, I'm, I'm very serious. I think you should run for my job. I said, well, who the hell would vote for me? Well, he said, I have been watching you. At every lunchtime, you're sitting with those old guys having lunch. I said, yeah, I kind of liked the conversation. It was about the war. Every one of them were in the war. They fought in the war. So he told me the horrors of war. And I learned all kinds of things. He said, those old guys kind of like you. I said, well, really? But you notice my attitude, though? Supervisors say something I don't like, I swear. He said, yeah, that's a good quality. I says, oh, really? Okay. And I said, just curiosity. Like, why would, why would they vote for me? He says, well, this is not a compliment, but maybe it is. He said, well, given all the shit that goes on in it, they prefer to you get fired than them. That's why they'll vote for you. <laughs> the rest is history. I did get elected. I became their chairperson. I learned many things. I learned one thing, that the union was a vehicle for making change. One third of those men that I was working with couldn't get their license to become certified. And as a result of that, they were paid $3 less per hour. Because the law clearly says you have to have a certificate. And the manager of the plant says, until they get that certificate, they're not going to get their raise. So young, you know, a little bit attitude. I went down to the Ministry of University and Colleges. They had an office on Young Street. And insist they had to come in and find a way to test these men's qualification. They don't speak English very well. They don't write English very well. They were great tradesmen. They had the skills and the ability to do the job. So I remember at the time talking to this man. His name was Chet Jeffries. I remember him today. This is 30-something years ago. And he said, you're not going to leave until you get what you want. I said, no. As a matter of fact, the next time I come here, I'm bringing these men. I'm going to pick at your goddamn office. <laughs> so he said, hey, I don't want to have a fight with you, kid. 
I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll arrange, even though the grandfathering of men, uh, this process is not over. We'll arrange for this, if you can get the manager to agree. They did come into the workplace. They did test these men, and they all got certified. They got a $3 raise. It wasn't about my skill, but fundamentally it was about the union as a vehicle to help improve the lives of other people. And I've always thought that as part of the work we do. And that's what the Fairness Campaign is about. How do we reconnect with our members? How do we engage them so they see the value of their unions? Not as just when they need something, recognizing day in and day out, we've got to struggle to build it, to grow it, to harness it. Because if we don't, we wouldn't have any other vehicle to fight to improve our lives in a day-to-day -day basis, what we do in the workplace and we do outside of society. And the Fairness Campaign is fundamental because when we did our research, which you've already been told, 30% of our members identify with their union. The other 70% says, die union, not my union, die union. And that 70%, we can get close back to us. We can reconnect with them because we need them. If we're gonna fight the bigger fight with political, gov with governments and employers across this country, we need all our members with us, not just a portion of our members. And it's fundamental to this campaign because the ads and the work we've been doing is critical. And I know we're seeing the results of that. Issues we've been raising with these ads are fundamental for the broader work we do in society. We talk about equity, we talk about pensions, we talk about good, good local jobs, about vacations. All these things matter to working people, not just to our members, but fundamentally, when our members see this ad, I can tell you over and over the emails we have gotten from complete strangers. At a, a brother wrote me a letter. He used to be an uh, American living in the United States, moved to Canada. He's now retired and living in Canada. He saw our ad, most recent ad in the spring. He says, you know, I'm not a union member. I saw your ad, never felt prouder about the labor movement in Canada. How could I contribute to your ad? He's not a union member. He wants to write a check for send to the CLC. So this is important work. And it's important that we continue to do these ads, and I'll run into in a minute. But more importantly, the work we do in the workplace, talking to our members, engaging, how we build a communication strategy, is critical. Because that's the foundation of our union. We have got to reconnect with our members. We've got to make them feel proud and feel that their union is the vehicle for them. But more importantly, we also have to build our relationship with the public, and that's what these ads are about. Because you see, with the public, most public don't know very much about unions. Here's three ingrained ideas the public have about unions. One, we're strike happy. Two, we're greedy. And third, we're selfish. I know you may not want to believe that, but in the testing and the work we have done, that has been fundamental to most of the thinking. How did they come to that conclusion? I don't have a clue. Here's the statistics you need to know. 99% of all collective agreement negotiated in this country is settled without a strike. 99%. That's a testament to the good work we do. But the 1% of a collective agreement that doesn't get resolved without a dispute, that's what the public, public remembers. And we have got to work hard to engage the public in the conversation about the value of our movement. Take for granted, who do you think would be there to fight for health, better health and safety laws if we didn't have a labor movement? Who would be there to fight for better, improving the employment standard laws across this land if we didn't have a labor movement? Human rights law that's entrenched in our constitution in every province across this country came about because trade unionists, men and women, fought to ensure we had a human rights commission and a human rights code because we understood what discrimination was like in the workplace. And some of us still struggle with it. But it was the labor movement who was there. Think of the work we do when there's a minimum wage campaign in provinces across this country who are working people. Talk, what kind of vacation system would we have if the labor movement were constantly fighting to improve forest protection under the law for vacation, but more importantly, to improve that beyond the law across this land? Sisters and brothers, we got a great story to tell. Hours of work and overtime pay come about because we work day in and day out to say, you need to have legislation to protect workers who don't have unions. That's what we do, and we got to find a way to communicate that with the public. Because the public need to understand the labor movement is not simply about serving its entire membership. What we desire for ourselves, we desire for all working Canadians across this country, and we need to tell that story.
whether it be EI that established at a federal level, the struggles we had to establish that, or public pensions, or health care, or public education. This is the value of the labor movement. And in these ads, and I'll get them to run it, speaks to the core value of our country, not just to our members. Could we just run this? Lean on me when you're not strong and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on. The collective effort of the 53 affiliates of Canadian Congress, this is our, our movement. These ads speak to our values, and we need to ensure everybody understands this. So I want to end on a very personal story, because like many of you, you have a family. I come out of a family, there were not nine of us, used to be ten, six brothers and four sisters. I can tell you, I don't enjoy going to all family dinners. Some I do, some I don't. And the reason why is very simple. You know, there's somebody in your family that just annoys the shit out of you. <laughs> you know, you sit at a dinner table and you decide you're going to have a nice meal and somebody got to say completely something stupid. So, the last time we had a family gather, I got a niece, so I have a brother-in-law to that process. I had nothing to do with picking him. And he decided he was going to tell me how much he loved Rob Ford. <laughs> so, you know, he's figured, like, okay, well, like, you deal with this, just... My partner saying to Jenny says to me, Sans, shut up. He says, you know, I'm going to say something. I said, you, you do what? He said, I love Rob Ford. I said, are you a moron? Have you ever looked in the mirror, you stupid idiot? <laughs> so we got into it. <laughs> Why did I have to get into it? I had to get into it because as a trade unionist, I cannot allow somebody to sit at a dinner table and be such an affront to my basic values. Is that difficult? Yes, it is difficult, especially in families. Because you know sometimes you may not see each other. In this case, it wouldn't be a bad thing. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is these are tough conversations we need to have sometimes in our families. And I think we as leaders, we can't duck our responsibility just because it's difficult. Either we are trade units or we're not. And we have to be proud. I wear it on my sleeve every single day I, I go, everywhere I go. Why? Because I fundamentally believe my family need to understand who I am and what I stand for. I will not tolerate for one second what is in my family or anywhere else, the indignity of somebody telling me something bad about the labor movement. And Rob Ford represents everything against our values and our principles, and including my own brother, I need to be told, go to hell, because I'm not going to sit here and listen to your bullshit. <laughs> is it tough? It is tough. It's difficult and it's challenging, but fundamentally, we've got to take that on. And my point is, is that we all have conversations. We all have conversations. And I think we have to do it more, not less. Because at a time when our movement are continuously being threatened, we have to take responsibility as how we're going to engage. And I think these ads give us opportunity, but more importantly, they give us a, a, an opening to talk. I can tell you how many people have watched this and said they're starting to have a conversation with their friend watching the hockey game because the ad came up, hey, I am a union member. For the first time, we could talk about it. So sisters and brothers, I know the benefit of this. The 53 affiliates of the CLC convention commit. We are going to have some new ads coming in the fall of this year, and we're going to continue to do the work in the workplace. We'll have some new ads coming next spring. We'll lead right into the federal election. I think we have done some remarkable work with that. So I want to end on a couple of other areas. This Labor Day is going to be very important. We have made a commitment to the CLC convention to have more events across this country to celebrate Labor Day. I know it's another day but just before you get back to work, but fundamentally, I would ask every one of you to come out and show your pride in your union with your flag and your T-shirts and whatever your union gives you. Because it's a day when we can talk about the value of the labor movement in this country, whether it's at a picnic or in a march in the city here of Toronto or other places, I'm urging, we want to show the flag right across this country. 80 of our Labor Council have organized an event across this country this year, the largest in the history of the Congress. And I'm going to say next year, 
100% of our Labor Council will have an event on Labor Day because I'm determined to work with them to ensure we can do that. It's critical also we take the Labor Day to bring our message, to talk about the union advantage. You know, our members make on average $5.17 if you're a male. And if you're a woman, you're going to make over $6 an hour. We need to talk about the union advantage. We need to talk about the fact that 80% of union members have a pension, have better benefits, and that's the value of the labor movement. We have to find a way, and this Labor Day, I'm also saying, across this country, we're going to use it to get a message. We're going to relaunch the retirement security campaign, which we've been going on for a little bit over four years, because fundamentally, we've got to win this fight that every Canadians in this country have a decent pension when they retire and should not have to live in poverty. 60% 60 of Canadians have no pensions. That's 12 million people. Could you imagine when they retire, if 12 million people are living in poverty, what a different country we would have? How would they consume? How would they support themselves? Fundamentally, this campaign is about very basic principle, that if someone spends a lifetime working, regardless of whether they're a union member or not, if you spend a lifetime working, I don't care who you are. From my perspective, you should not have to rest, live the rest of your life in poverty and in indignity. And that's a fundamental value of Canadians, and we must win this fight. This fight is about whether or not every Canadian is entitled to something most of us take for granted in this room, that we will get a decent pension because we have a union to fight for us day in and day out. But fundamentally, for those of us who belong to pension, you should know coverage of private pensions are going down, not up used to be in the high 40s and it's dropping to the 30s and it will keep dropping. The Harper government recently tabled legislation that will likely convert all defined pension plans in both Crown corporations and including private employers, they'll come back this fall, there'll be a fight on this, to convert their plans where one employers are going to take all the risk to get rid of defined benefit plans. I can tell you we are going to fight like hell, but fundamentally what this campaign has been about, when we started it, not a single government supported us. Today we have more than two-thirds of the province and two-thirds of the population what is required to amend the CPP. And our position has been very clear. We need to double the benefits of the CPP so that everybody, when they retire, will have enough income to look after themselves and have a life of dignity, fundamentally if you work in this country. I made it clear at the CLC convention. As part of my leadership, I've been in the trenches now with this campaign for over four years. We will win. It's not a question if we will win. We'll, we will win regardless. And even if we have to get rid of the Stephen Harper government to win this campaign, because every polling we have done, it shows up. We have won every single editorial board support across this country to improve CPP. Even the Globe and Mail came out last December and says, this is the moment the federal government must act. The Ontario government is so frustrated, including other provinces with the federal government, obstructing them from doing the right thing. By the way, it's a province that's the custodian of the CPP, it's not the federal government. Yet the Harper government refused to want to have anything to do with improving the benefits. Ontario is determined to say, we're going to fight. We would prefer to improve the CPP, but if the federal government would not join us, we'll cr create an Ontario pension plan. I want to commend Premier Wynne for having the courage to put that on the table and to campaign on it because they send a clear message to the people of this province. You deserve better. You should have a national government that provide better. If they're not going to do it, we'll do it. We'll work with you to make sure. By the way, and she got a mandate to make sure it happens in this province. We'll work with her to ensure she can succeed. But more importantly, we're not going to defer from our campaign. The best solution will be to improve the CPP. That's the best solution. I'm going to continue to fight with you, and I ask you to join. We'll relaunch this campaign. We'll have town halls across this country bring seniors and other coalition partners in and say, this is our fight, this is our moment. Because for that 12 million Canadians, we need to give them a vehicle to say, you can have better when you retire. And the only way we can do that is using the CPP. RSP is not working, despite been around since the 1950s. 40% of your earnings throughout the lifetime will be taken up in fees from RSP. PRPP is not going to do that. And if employers continue to attack private pension plan, the coverage is going to continue to go down. We can't allow that. You know, the rhetoric from the right against public sector pensions, I was on Rex Murphy and somebody called in and said, you know, public sector pensions are too rich. 
So I said, you know, the issue is not about public sector pension or what is too rich. If you're telling me $18,000 that the average public sector pension is worth when they retire is too much, is too rich, then there's something wrong. I said, the issue is not public sector. The issue is that why isn't every Canadian having a decent pension in this country? That's the real issue. <laughs> so sisters and brothers, this is an important campaign for us as it is for the broader Canadians who don't have a pension plan in this country. The next issue we're going to raise, and we're going to make these ballot box issues when we go to the polls, is about child care. For the longest conversation we've been having in this country, why can't we have a national child care system? How can we have one province that have a national ch a pro provincial child care system for $7 a day, and throughout this country we have a patchwork that doesn't work? 70% of working families have child care needs in this country, yet we rely on all kinds of arrangement. Grandparents, friends, neighbors, strangers to look after our kids. I think we've got to make this an issue. This is not a women's issue. This is a working people issue. It's a political matter. And your Congress and your president will make sure we'll fight like hell to put this on the ballot box as a fundamental issue. If you can find billions of dollars to give to corporations for tax cut, by God, we can find the money to create a national child care system in this country. <laughs> our most precious resources are our kids. And if we, corporations today, as I speak to you, are sitting on $600 billion, what is Mark Carney would coin dead money. Money that should be invested in creating jobs. Money that should be investing in research and development and machinery and equipment. Yet they're sitting on the bank. This is where our tax cut is. Can you imagine what we would add to the GDP if we had a national child care system? How much jobs it will create? How much more productive the economy will be for working men and women across this country? This is our moment and we've got to fight for our dreams and our aspiration. And by God, we'll do everything we can to create that momentum because we need to win this fight. It's always been unfair, despite whatever we say that working women's been sharing an unfair part of the burden. It's about time we stand up and say, enough is enough. We'll create this momentum to ensure we win this fight because we need it. Yeah. And the last two things I'll touch on is health care. Everybody knows the value of our national health care system. But it's increasingly has been privatized across this country. The most recent decision by the federal government to not renegotiate the health accord means they will take $36 billion out of the health care funding to the province. When we created health care, the arrangement was a 50-50 one. Today, the federal government is putting less than 20% into health care funding, and it will go even less with the new formula they provide. Sisters and brothers, we're not careful. We might end up like our friends across the board in the United States, where the system keeps privatized more and more because the money is not there, or government doesn't want to put that. We have got to fight to ensure we have a federal government who become a partner with the province to ensure our health care system is fully funded. And they're going, to they're going to enforce the Canada Health Act across this land because we should not have to have one model of health care in Ontario and a different model in PEI. This is not the kind of Canada we want to live in. And we've got to make sure this is a ballot box issue at the end of the day and the next election. Sister Brothers, the one area I want to end on you is on jobs. Most of us in this room are fortunate. I have never had to deal with unemployment in my entire life. But as I speak to you today, we've got double digit unemployment for young people. I sat at the Etfo dinner the other night beside a sister. The first time in our life, 32 years of age, you've had a full-time job. There are kids, you know, among your own families and friends, who we told to go get a set secondary education and still can't find a full-time job. We have had today in our country almost one quarter of the population working part-time, temporary or contract. They will never know what it's like to have a pension plan or a benefit plan or the fact to have even regular hours. There's something fundamentally wrong with, with this picture. A country as rich as ours with such much resources, we can't provide decent jobs for young people to give them hope. There are more kids moving back today with their parents at home than any time in the history because they can't afford their own place, because they can't find a decent job. It's been an entire failure. Since 2008, with the financial and economic crisis, we've had double digit unemployment in this country for young people. 
Over one million Canadians are unemployed, despite all the nauseated message from the Stephen Harper government how well they're managing the economy. Of course, if the full numbers are put in, it's over two million Canadians underemployed or unemployed in this country. We've got to make good, decent jobs a priority for our movement in this country. Why shouldn't your kids and my kids expect that when they grow up, that they can find a decent job in this country, where it pays enough wage that they can look after themselves and have a decent life? That's what we got. I think it's fundamental to the next election we expose this government for what it is. It's been creating a low-wage economy. It brought in temporary foreign workers, allow employers to abuse them and mistreat them, and yet tells us we can't. We can't have kids flipping hamburgers if you pay them a decent wage. Whatever happened when the McDonald's were forced, these are not some mom and pop shop. These are multinational corporations. By God, they can pay enough money, kids will go there and flip hamburgers. They shouldn't exploit temporary foreign workers to do this. So we've got to fight ahead, sisters and brothers, so I don't want to take any more of your time. I really want to say the importance of this work and about more importantly about the next election. It's going to require all of us, by the way, rolling up our sleeves. It's going to take hard work. Harper conservative numbers are going down. That's a good thing. What it state is, I don't know. These guys are smart. They've got a lot of money, and they'll do a lot of things to bribe us before the next election comes. It's fundamental we understand what this fight will be about. This fight in the next elections, what kind of country do we want to grow up in, or our kids to grow up in? Can they expect better than us as parents? We'll be the first generation to tell our kids they shouldn't expect better, they ex should expect less. That's not what we were told by our parents, by the way. We were told if you get a half-decent chance, you can make a good life for yourself. If you get a half-decent education, you can do better. Our kids are now told, don't ever expect to have a full-time job. Don't ever expect to have a pension if you work for your employer. And don't even expect to have benefits. There's two workplaces, one here in Toronto and one in Thunder Bay. There are a strike going on in Bombardier, one of the richest corporations in Canada, making streetcar for our city and trains for the province of Ontario, have his workers out on the streets. You know why? Because they said the next generation of worker who comes to work here should not have the same pension as you. The next generation of worker who come to work here should not have the same health care benefits coverage as you. And those workers are on the strike saying, to hell with you, they're going to have the same of us. We'll do what is necessary. There's another company right here in Toronto, steel workers, on strike exactly the same thing. This is what the austerity at the end of done to our country. Sisters and brothers, I came to this country as an immigrant. I was fortunate to get involved in the labor movement. And I can't tell you how blessed I was. It is a remarkable opportunity for what we've been given, the gift to use our movement to fight for the values of working people. As your president of your Congress, I know one thing. We've got a year to do whatever we can across this land to get our members and working people engaged in a conversation about what kind of Canada we want. As your president, I know one thing for sure. I'm going to do everything I can. I started off this week speaking at the ADFO meeting. I went to Victoria, I spoke to a PSAC convention. I went to Ottawa, speak to an IBEW convention. I'm here speaking to you. Before the week is over, I would have spoken to over 1,600 delegates of unions across this country. Why is that important? Is it tiring? Yes, it is. But I can tell you one thing. We need to know what's at stake here. This is the most fundamental struggle we've ever been involved. If these guys get back in office, they will finish the job. They will forever change this country. There's generations who went to war to fought for our democracy. Harper government should not allow to change this country in a way that we can't recognize it. And as your leader, I know one thing for sure. I will do everything in my power to ensure we get this message to workers, get ourselves ready and mobilize and engage. And fundamentally, I know one thing for sure. We represent 3.3 million members across this country. If we can get them engaged and mobilized, we will certainly change the future of this country in the next election. With your effort and support, I know we can do that. So I want to conclude to say how grateful and thankful I am for your support at the CLC Convention. It's nice to have friends, but it's nice to have even good friends like you. Thank you so much.